Okay, we're going to get into some of the histories of ancient Anatolia. And uh, I just recently did a video, which I've released right before these, on a knot and where the name Anatolia comes from. And it gives some prehistory to what we're going to talk about more in depth here for an article kind of steps on it a little bit brushes upon it but doesn't go into depth of the time of Cronus and the Titans that were living in this area in a time at once they didn't have to have walls around their cities but they weren't near this large either they would have been much more like you know one of these clusters that are here versus a multi-cluster and superstructure and everything that goes on so notice how they had double walls on it so you could go in the front gate but if they kept the front gate closed and you tried to aggress on them they'd open up the side gate and you'd come in here from expecting to whoop their ass and they'd have you trapped and be able to shoot you from above and uh katie bar the door behind you and you're in trouble definitely so this is hattusha and it's uh, one of the capitals of the Hittites. And the Hittite people are ones we call the Hittites today. Are actually the fourth big power back in the ancient world. And nobody really talks about them anymore. As I said in the other vid that uh, everybody gets hooked up on Egypt and Samaria and later Greeks and stuff. And you might talk about the Assyrians. But what's right in the middle of all of those in the fork of roads that go out in directions are these people in Anatolia in fact they're the egress in between the ancient Minoans and other than them taking boats straight to Egypt and so on like that across there pretty much everything went through these people they were known to have been a very rich people and eventually became King Midas which their richness was looked upon as a curse. So let's get into this. Anatolian Histories Part 1 Emerging Empires and Lands Changing Hands What comes to mind when one says Anatolia or Ancient Anatolia? Does the phrase Land of the Rising Sun, as the ancient Greeks called it, appear? Or because it technically belongs to the Middle East, do you think of an arid desert like it is today? Anatolia was arguably the most desired land of the ancient and medieval world. It saw the rise of the Assyrians, the Hittites, the Greeks, the Persians, the Romans, and Byzantines, and the Turks. Especially in ancient times, it seemed anyone who had some power in their hands desired to control Anatolian lands. By recounting the story of Anatolia, its importance will be displayed. Early Civilizations in Anatolia The story of Anatolia dates back to the Paleolithic dates of at least 20,000 to 15,000 BC, but only tools and little villages dating to those times have been discovered so far. Actual civilizations came to Anatolia around the Neolithic period, which is around 15,000 to 4,000 BC primarily starting out with uh, around 12,000 BC conspicuously but there are sites that are dating back even earlier than that and who have they been able to already attach this to? Well, during that time several civilizations traveled to and lived in Anatolia. We can see their legacy in the prehistoric settlements of Gobekli Tepe, Katalhoyuk, Hasilar, Mersin, and Nevali Kori, among a bunch of others that they found now, just mentioning those. These settlements tend to be much larger in size and complexity when compared to contemporary sites that are found in Europe. Catalhoyuk is arguably the most complex Neolithic settlement. And, uh, well, these things that were built in stone have something left to them. And even though they're made out of bricks in lines, as you can see, they have something left to them. Things that are built out of wood don't have as much left to them. And I don't know if the author is aware of the site that predates this. That's a big wood hinge that they found and so on, things like that. But, of course, it's not a settlement to this point, And you're not going to find that 
because all those wood houses and things burnt and went away long ago and you won't actually see that effect but also when the Proto-Indo-Europeans came in and whipped it up another notch and then later whipped it up a second notch it got really going and uh, so at some point definitely you have that in effect for the at the last ice age the uh, glaciers were pushed down so far that uh, not much was going on in Europe and especially not in upper Europe in any way shape or form so oh, this is cattle Hoyuk and I wish they would have showed a cluster of pictures inside some of the little houses that are here because they have the uh, bullhorn set up and little shelves and everything and stuff it's uh they made houses out of them when the Neolithic gave way to the Bronze Age around 3000 through 1200 BC more complex and efficient agricultural civilizations arose and their love for Anatolia either caused them to advance or give way to their demise so eventually there came some problems and I guess because that's bordering here on the collapse of the Bronze Age that she's referring to that situation Hattusha, the cursed city of the Hattai of the Hittite Empire. Oh, we're going to have to get into that. Hattai and Hittites in Anatolia. The early Bronze Age gave birth to the Hatti, the first notable civilization in Anatolia. Not to be confused with the Hittites, the Hatti were a different civilization. Really, it was a combination when it comes into it. There's earlier people and then later people come in and express it to a further extent. Their origins are not known, but it is theorized that they came from the Caucasus Mountains looking for better land to live on. They had a written language, a religion, and a city called Kanesh. Clay documents have revealed the Hatti had connections at, to a trading partnership with the Akkadian Kingdom of Sargon the Great, and it is important to note that while the Akkadians had land in Anatolia, it was only a few kilometers and they influenced Anatolia by political means only. thought there was a picture to go, yeah, it's coming up. Around 2000 BC, the Indo-European Hittites arrived in Anatolia with their culture, language, and chariots. The Hatti people were not so organized, <coughs> could not resist the Hittite advancement, and soon they were absorbed into the Hittite culture. The Hittites formed a mighty kingdom in Anatolia. They mastered agriculture in the Anatolian plateau and built a capital called Hattusis. The Hittites had the power to challenge the Egyptians and Assyrians, but their reign came to an end when the mysterious Sea Peoples spawned into Levant and raided city after city around 1100 BC. The Hittites were having economic troubles before the raids began and individual cities in the Hittite kingdom gained more power. All of this resulted in the collapse of the kingdom and uh, Syro-Hittite cities ruled independently in Anatolia. It is important to mention that during this time the city of Welusa was also destroyed. That's commonly known as the city of Troy, by the way. Welusa was a major trading city for the Hittite kingdom. And I'm going to do a video coming up about ancient city of Troy and what the reality of this horse and situation that we have because most people are not going to really even correlate these type of people along with the ancient Trojans of Troy and things like that you know really are they no but he mentioned that they were already having trouble at this time and there had already been a series of droughts at this time and I already talked about in a recent video how a series of volcanoes had caused an extreme amount of problem in a drought situation and not just here and due to that fact it made these sea people strike out to places that they knew had food but whenever they went there these people were already starving in front of them and it became a bad day we'll just put it that way an easier way to put it so here's the famous lion gates 
one of many of different ones. There's the other one that has the two lines at the top, and so on. Yeah, and Psychopium rock work in it too, by the way. In the midst of the Hittite collapse, the Assyrian kingdom was consolidating its power in Mesopotamia. When the Hittite cities became disunited and weak, Adad Narari, the second of the Assyrians, mustered up an army and conquered most of the Hittite lands, about 45% of Anatolia. Adad Narari also invaded Egypt. The next king, Ashurbanipal II, conquered more land to the east. Assyria was the most dominant empire of its time, but like all other strong kingdoms of ancient history, it too fell. A Mede named Cyaxes rebelled against the Assyrian kingdom and formed an independent Median kingdom. The uh, ancient historian Herodotus noted that the Medes were called Aryans and all of these people had at a certain time, but the Medes were before Medes had gone to them in Medea and they changed their name, just like Persia had done whenever Persis had come from Athens. Syax Ares, if you look at the name, Syax Ares, then allied himself with Scythia and Samaria, oh snap, Assyria's enemies, and the coalition then attacked Assyria and destroyed the once mighty kingdom. In a more depth of what actually happened there, but a fast way if I can, during all this drought that went on, you know, Assyria had taken and conquered all of the Levant again and pushed their way up too. But they receded back just like everybody did, and it left people kind of half screwed. And one can imagine that whenever the Sea Peoples came in and attacked through these certain cities, that what that did was broke down the trade network. And if you think nowadays, if you were to stop the trade network of foods going to stores and everything might affect you some, back then it was real, real important. And as soon as that chain broke down in any way, there was a huge problem. And it broke down, and the people that were right in the middle of this all got taken over repeatedly a couple of times because everybody thought they could do it much better whenever those people that thought they could do much better were already starving and running for trying to find some form of aid or help whenever they got there, they were like, uh, I will just take it. Kind of works out that way. So that was the fall of Assyria. And here we see a picture of Assyrians and what they would have looked like. So you can see those pointy hats that are on them and their beard style which looks just like the Sumerians and stuff. You can tell their caucasoid form and everything to them. Everything looks calm and dandy except for he appears to be holding somebody's head. I often think this picture is he's holding a head upside down by the beard. For that's the nose and this is the ear. Uh, you can see it the other way too if you just look at it and you go, okay, but it's stretching down. So, uh, yeah. Boots and pants. That's kind of important. Now, these people were wearing pants but they still have kind of a skirt going on or a kilt but they're wearing pants right at this time here they're showing hmm oh I forgot to mention whenever I started this we're also going to talk about music and how somehow music and classical music leading all the way up through everything has to do with this situation for it does in some way and it's been kept for that reason maybe you'll understand as I go into it the rise of the Phrygians after the fall of the Hittites and during the rise of the Assyrians a group of people possibly from Thrace Thracians came into Anatolia they were known as the Phrygians as in Phrygian caps we talk about so much these Phrygians formed a kingdom in northwest Anatolia like the Hittites they benefited from the rich Anatolian soil and formed a capital called Gordion. 
The Phrygians were weak at first and had to pay Assyrians tribute to just live in the area, but as their population grew, they became stronger and more dominant in Anatolia. They even built a second city called Ankira. Ancira or Ankira was used as a major city by later civilization, and now it's the city of Ankara, the capital city of the Republic of Turkey. And when we talk about Phrygians and what's that got to do with music, if you do get into music at all, it's a scale that they have. Most people, I don't want to go deep into music and everything, but most people know there's a scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. <coughs> One of those notes, usually in the center of that portion there, can be offset to where it's a half step instead of a full step in situations like this. So it makes things like a minor fourth or a minor third, right? And in a chord, it would be an augmented and make it such things as minor and major. But there is a scale known as Phrygian. And there are songs that are written about it, you know, with it. Most of them are, you know, stuff that's written in the old days. A lot of these that we're going to talk about here are things that in Bach and Beethoven and things like this used. And you think it wasn't used very much. But as that roll into the heavy metal, dark metal scene that they had kind of, you know, and Ozzy Osbourne, Randy Rose, all that kind of crap that was coming on, it came on strong. And so they ended up having these things that were very much Bach type musically oriented put into a heavy metal span. You can see it from there, Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and all these other types that were pulling off these things that were music teachers that knew these scales and the reason it sounded so radically different than other people was because it was utilizing these scales that nobody really used. I mean, most everybody through the 60s and 70s was using a pentatonic scale, which is selecting five out of the group, a la the penta group, and it's that do 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 da the blues sounding thing. The Phrygians ended up fighting the Assyrians and managed to defend their lands. They were Indo-Europeans, Aryans, and spoke a language related to Alto, uh, Italo-Celtic. Oh snap! During the last years of the Phrygian kingdom, the famed King Midas became king. Some historians theorize that Midas had turned everything into gold, representing the wealth of the kingdom. Rich or poor, the Phrygian kingdom fell due to an invasion by the Sumerians of the Black Sea coast. And then it's uh, so much of a flair sounding like uh, Conan the Barbarian and things that happened up here in the Black Sea coast. Why, why does that sound so familiar? Well, if you've been watching my videos, it's quite familiar. Looking at this, that's, uh, that's Adonis Dion This Dionysus is the green man. You're supposed to be Persephone or Aphrodite. That's King Midas. There, can't tell. And kids playing with a goat. Midas and Dionysus by Pusin, showing the end of the myth in which Midas thanks Dionysus for freeing him of the gift curse causing uh, previously granted. It's uh, it's in Nif Nymphenburg Palace, Munich, Germany. N Nymphenburg. You got nymphs there? Is there something in elder times that has to do with that? Well, snap. So this is him thanking Dionysus for taking the curse off of him for he had begged for the fact that he could have it and do these things. That's a strange story. There's been people have said, well, if Dionysus is Dia, Dios of Nyasa, is where that comes from, and then he's him, if if King Midas was given the area to rule, like given the, like, sure, go ahead and kick their ass and take them over. If he was given that opportunity by these people, that plays out much different in history than wherever thought it is. But it's hung in this ancient story that whenever I was a kid, was a little kid's cartoon you saw every once in a while, and this King Midas and everything he touched turned to gold. Right? But there's more to that story. I did a video on it about three years ago. Greek colonies settle in Anatolia. Yep, they did. Also, during the fall of these Hittites, the Greeks west of Anatolia had internal conflicts. The Dorian Greeks were fighting the Ionian Greeks, 
And by the way, Doric or Dorian is a scale and it's been used in famous songs and Ionian is also a scale. Uh, here's a way to think of it. If, um, if you have a, a lyre or a kithara, you know, it's kind of that lyre kind of thing, kind of like a mini harp. There's only a certain amount of strings, and what you do to make up the the notes that you would be jamming on a guitar, each one is just tuned to that, and whenever you pluck it, you make those notes. So these are tuned to these scales for songs. You understand? It's a guitar that can play anything. It's a piano that can play everything. Because it's got all of the scales, and on a guitar, by having the frets in there and being able to shorten it, which has to do with sacred geometry, by the way, and fifths and thirds and the concept that they have that gives us the scales that we use today. Everything's built on sacred geometry. And it just makes sense. And in fact, if it's off, your ear understands that it's off. And they've pretty much proven it's not because you're so used to hearing this, but it's off. You can also tell the difference between running normal 440A and running 432 that they do now, which is basically tuning it down a half tone. These, uh, Athens had people colonizing Western Anatolia at the time. The Ionians were losing and they sought refuge from Athens the strongest Greek city at the time. So the Ionians were seeking refuge from there, and so they moved in. Athens had people colonizing western Anatolia at the time, but there was land that remained empty. Athens granted permission for the Ionians to settle in Anatolia. The Ionian Greeks settled and took advantage of the Hittites' ruined cities. They formed the city of Miletus, which has to do with a person that went all the way through the Pillars of Hercules, and around in the story that we talked about two or three times here lately of Scottish origins and what people talk about that. The biggest Ionian city from the old remains of the ancient Hittite city of Milawanda. Ionians also built the cities of Ephesus, a city that will gain much relevance with time and an ancient Greek colony composed of fishermen called Byzantium in the 7th century BC, Byzantium was strategically placed upon a peninsula and four centuries later a man by the name of Constantine saw the colony and turned it into the ancient metropolis of Constantinople known today as Istanbul which houses 17 million people and there was a drastic change that went on there not to go into that Constantine and Constantinople but uh, these are ruins of the ancient Greek theater in Miletus, Turkey. And you look how they have this. You can go under the stands. And short of there being a football field or something out there for the people to watch, this really was a drama type center where they would put little backdrops and scenes. And these people would come out and do these certain things, you know, and stuff. And don't have the rigging that I can see that they would have any setup, but they had other places and ways they would do it and uh, pop up gods and people up out of the floor and trap doors and situations like that. And it looks like these archways here in it have been filled in. And in ancient times, that would have been hollowed and up under there too. It's amazing. And I'm sure it's built on that exact architecture where you can stand right here and drop a coin on the ground and as long as everybody's shutting up you hear it just as plain as day you can snap your fingers and you hear it echo to everybody that's up here perhaps this wall here helped in that sound reverberation at one time and it was taller Dorians lived in southern Greece and had the island of Crete under their dominion they followed the Ionians and colonized southwestern Anatolia founding the Cilia, city of Halicarnassus, hometown of Herodotus, and that has to do with the sun, Helios, sun city. This city is known as today as Bodrum, 
The ancient Greeks also followed in footsteps of the Ionians and colonized Anatolia, taking places north of the Ionians and making the island of Lesbos their headquarters. Hmm, wonder why. The Greeks fought one each other and continued to have border disputes for decades to come. Well, there was trouble with the Mas uh, Macedonians, too, in the first place, and trying to really get it all together, but even places like Egypt, even though it got put together as one, quite often broke off into two and back into one. I mean, uh, what was it they said uh, in ancient Germany? The shite happens. The Greeks fought each other and continued to have border disputes for decades to come. The Lydians, which there's a scale, musical scale for that, people, conquer the Greek lands. The fall of the Hittites also gave birth to the Lydian civilization. Lydians spoke a language related to Hittite, Indo-European, Aryan, and formed their civilization around southwestern Anatolia, but more inland than the Greeks. They formed the city of Sardis, and people have said it's Sardinia has to do with those Danites and, oh snap, in the modern region of Manissa. Like the Phrygians, they were weak at first, but with time they became a force to be reckoned with. The Lydians ended up conquering their Greek neighbors to the west and formed a unified kingdom with most of western Anatolia under their belt. They also credited were the first use of minted coins. And you can see here what they've actually done is they would take a mold that is made out of stone that has this carving in it and you can see this is a bull with the horns and a lion head and they would drip a puddle of the gold into it that's molten and let it cool and then strike the back of it and you can see that they had these punches and they would punch once on one side once on the other giving the imprints on it and this was supposed to be a cert certain amount of gold that was made in each punch. And even though it looks irregular, it's all supposed to be the same teaspoon of gold, if you will, in situations like that. That's a Lydian coin, coin from 6th century BC. It's in, now in the Pergamon Museum. Some historians such as Herodotus claim a group of Lydian colonists sailed to Italy and formed the Etruscan civilization. Oh, really? But the theory has its opponents, and debate continues to this day. Well, I would say that they can be the same people, and that would make sense. But the Cyclopean building of the Etruscans dates to before this point. So you'd almost say, where did the Etruscans go? Did they go here? Or did they go west? Where did they go when they got absorbed somewhat there's a large portion of them that went someplace and did it go that way or is that something that was told to Herodotus in hearsay did they come from there the Lydian kingdom was at its height of its power during the king time of King Croesus who was renowned for his wealth the Persians and other civilizations use the simile rich as Croesus to describe the wealth of the rich people. And we would think of now, well, rich as King Midas, right? But no, the expression was Croesus for them back then. This is the second king from Anatolia to have his legend based on money and wealth. Unlike other Anatolian kingdoms, the Lydians fell during their strongest time at the hands of the Persian Empire. And any tales seem to be that what ended up causing the fact and the problem, much like King Solomon getting so wise that he did this and that, and then it, things went to crap, right? Well, ironically, that's kind of the story here, where Midas was even cursed by his wealth. He had so much money, he didn't know what to do, right? Prehistoric Anatolians removed flesh from the bones to ease the transition into death. Yeah, that's that ancient rite. I'll probably do a video on it if it, if it has anything worth checking out. That's uh, King Croesus right there. Looks kind of familiar to us in some ways. And the little spotted 
leopard hide type thing around him here. Croesus receiving tribute from a Lydian peasant. Mega power emerges in Anatolia. Persia was the first mega power to enter Anatolia. The predecessor of the Persian Empire was the Median Empire, who they call themselves Aryans, which Persians also call themselves Aryans, which had established itself in early Anatolia after defeating the Assyrians. The Persians were subjects of the Median Empire after Syax Arces, the emperor of the Medes, died. His son, Atazayes, replaced him. Astigi, yeah, married his daughter to the Persian king to solidify his rule. Astyagi's daughter had a son named Cyrus. Yes, that Cyrus. The Great. Astyagi's wanted to kill Cyrus due to a bad dream about him, which happens all the time with this, your son's gonna grow up and da-da-da and ordered Harpagus to do the deed. Harpagus gave him away to a poor family instead. By the way, I talk about this a little bit in my deal on Snow White and how this is a male form of echoing this concept a little bit because years later, Cyrus was shown to Astagis to, who was furious and apparently fed Harpagus to his own son. Yep, they wrote down that this happened. And so Harpagus was enraged, and Cyrus became the king of the Persians. After the death of his biological father, Cambyses. And Cambyses' sister is named Moreau. That's what Moreau is named after in southern Egypt. And stuff that's in there. Uh, Kandake, or Candace, is a uh, Persian queen's epitaph during the time. And so here we can see a depiction of these people. And this is whenever this man right here, Cyrus and Astyages, painting King Astyages, sending Harpagus to kill young Cyrus. A few years later, Cyrus overthrew Astyages and formed the Persian Empire with the help of Harpagus. This happened in 550 BC after the internal conflict. Cyrus assembled his troops and set the Lydian kingdom to the west as his destination. Now, uh, the Babylonians had just got through whooping ass all over on the Canaanite area in the Levant and took them all hostages in there. And whenever he came out swinging, he set them free as one of the things that he did first. He even helped them to return the Temple of Baal into the temple now that they have. But ironically, uh, somebody has just about proven that the wall that they wail at was Part of the Roman infrastructure that they had built in the wall is really the one over there. But that doesn't matter. That's what people have been doing for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So cool. Go with it. Um, three years after he overthrew Astyages, he was siege the capital of Lydia in Sardis. He conquered all of the Anatolia and established the biggest empire that the world had seen up until that time. But right after that, gets changed because that's the time of Alexander the Great. And he actually takes over everything that they had and more. And it's a cool story, too, where whenever he whoops ass through them, he basically tells them what he's doing. And uh, that he's got his children and stuff. And that if he wants his children back, all he's got to do is come and ask. But when you come to me, don't come to me as an equal they will come to me as the new king of Persia and so on. And he had taken over Egypt, uh, really destined as a liberator there. And so this is more of the end of it. And we saw about five scales used in music that were all used right through there too. But the time of Cyrus the Great, and he was the great liberator, that didn't really set things up the way that it was supposed to have done whenever he did it. But... Uh, that land was never theirs solo to begin with. Anyhow, guys, you could go deeper into little parts of this, and uh, I think I will in a few of the civilizations that they had early. And uh, 
to clarify some points here. Cattle Hoyuk. To clarify some points here and stuff. But uh, other than that, that kind of gives an intro idea of these people that a lot of people, unless you've studied this exact thing or Near Eastern history, you don't get to know about it much. And unless you specialize in this area, you don't really get to find how it all fit together. Because a lot of people believe that they came from the ancient Sumerians whenever it busted down in the real proto-Sumerian. And it busted down and when pushed back north and through the time of Sargon the Great blended into these people. There's other people that said no, those ended up being uh, the Etruscans. And it's like no, the Etruscans were there long before that so you can't give that. Well, were they? Well, who was there? And there's this all conflict of on who was exactly where, when, and I can't wait for genetics to try to start proving a little bit more of exactly who was where, when. Once we get enough of these together, you'll actually be able to say, well, they were here, and then they were there, and they were there, and did this, and did that, and so on. Like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy, guys, and we'll get on to the next one. Peace.